MaximumFun.org. I'm going to start by just reading you um, something I found quite extraordinary. It's from the Chinese Materia Medica. This is a, a, a book of substances. It's kind of the Merck Manual or the physician's desk reference of you know the f- ancient history. And it's different things. This is the animal section, and it includes humans. Um, and there it, it's things that you would take to cure certain ailments that you have. And this is called, um, this is called Human Mummy Confection. And uh, I have to read this to you. Okay. In Arabia, there are men 70 to 80 years old who are willing to give their bodies to save others. The subject does not eat food. He only bathes and partakes of honey. After a month, he only excretes honey. Parentheses, the urine and feces are entirely honey. And death follows. (laughs) Now we get to the recipe part. His fellow men place him in a stone coffin full of honey in which he macerates. I think they meant marinate. (laughs) Because to macerate is to chew. So uh, that doesn't make any, uh, perhaps a translation error, Ma- in which he macerates. The date is put upon the coffin given the year and month. After a hundred years, the seals are removed. A confection is formed, <laughs> which is used for the treatment of broken and wounded limbs. A small amount taken internally will immediately cure the complaint. I think this is because it just gives you something far more dire to complain about. <laughs> uh, It is scarce in Arabia, where it's called mellified man. And then there's a a note, the Burmese priests have the custom of preserving their chief abbots in coffins full of honey. I read that and I realized honey is actually a, a, it works as a a preservative, it's an antibacterial. I think that someone came across an attempt to embalm a priest, a Burmese priest or whatever it is, and thought, didn't realize this was an attempt to preserve him and thought, Oh, this is some sort of, and they took the date on the coffin as sort of like the date on the wine bottle, rather than the date that the guy died and realized this must be something that you eat. And so that's the only thing I can think of for how um, human mummy confection came about. But there, uh, it is one of many um, uh, truly revolting um, things that people used to give themselves uh, to, to cure themselves. So you can now see a little bit of why my publicist is a little reluctant to, to do a Mary Roach cookbook. The other recipe I love and stiff is ballistic gelatin. And this, I think just because I love the surprising juxtaposition of guns and hospital dessert. (laughs) Um, But ballistic gelatin is a substance, it's an alternative to using a cadaver uh, to test ammunition. Um, uh, When you are testing ammunition, you may be doing this for, for several reasons. Historically, they used to use cadavers to test stopping power of rifles. In other words, um, if you shoot, there was, it was kind of, it was actually sort of humanitarian. They were trying to figure out what is a way to stop someone running fiercely toward me with a bayonet, but not kill him. There was actually work that was done, like we want to stop them. Stopping power was, you want to stop them fast. And if you can do it without killing them, that'd be great. But if we have, if we have to kill them, then so be it. But stopping power was researched with cadavers, which cracked me up because they're pretty much stopped. <laughs> they're... Um, and the, but they would do things, I came across this study, uh, I think it was 18, no, it was 1904, the uh, US Army was, the Ordnance Department was t- just thinking about switching to a different rifle. So they dressed a, a cadaver, and, and I love that they put them actually in the actual uniform, and it's important, details are important, so they put these guys in uniform and they hung, they suspended them on tackle in the, one of the you know, sheds that they use, and then they would try to figure out, based on how far back the body would swing, how good the stopping power was, which it really was stupid science, but kind of entertaining. Um, when you're testing ammunition, the, um, the other thing you want to look into is what happens inside, say, the leg. Does it just, does the bullet just go straight through, which is bad because then it ricochets off the wall and it shoots you, haha, the ultimate revenge. Um, so they have something called, um, ballistic gelatin so that you can see the wound channel. And this sounds like something I would really like to have in my cable package. (laughs) Um, But anyway, so you have this block of gelatin and it's made uh, made with Knox gelatin. This is a product you can go to the supermarket and buy. It's a little um, package. My mom used to have Knox gelatin because she believed that it made your fingernails stronger. That was their marketing tactic because it's really a product for which there is no real use. Um, it's made from hooves. I think that's why people thought, oh, 
It'll make your nails stronger, your, 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 your own hooves. But anyway, so ballistic gelatin was a very exciting thing for the Knox company because now there was a use for their product. Uh, and so you make this big block. And I found, I found a recipe online. It's instructions for homemade, it really says this, homemade ballistic gelatin, which sounds all, you know, it sounds very checkered tablecloth until you read that the letterhead says um, custom cartridge incorporated precision ultra high performance ammunition. So it's not, it's not exactly that homey. It is the only recipe that includes, um, basically there's outfits for the, for the dish. You, you, would, um, you can use it naked or you can put um, lightly clothed is two layers of t-shirt in front of the block before you shoot it, um, or heavily clothed, which is two layers of t-shirt plus two layers of jeans in front of the block, and then you would shoot it, and that would be, um, that would give you your results for your, for your ammunition. And um, the, the, the thing about ballistic gelatin versus a cadaver is that it is, um, it's consistent. Every block is the same. Cadavers tend to be, you know, some of them are very fit and muscular and Schwarzenegger-like, and others are old and decrepit. Uh, so the, the work that um, they've done with cadavers uh, wasn't very useful. It was also um, a publicity nightmare, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, cadavers are usually, if the military gets involved with cadavers for research, usually it's something, uh, it's something along the lines of protective gear. For example, there is a uh, there's a study in which they, again, faithfully dressed in a uniform, a cadaver that was a landmine, it was for uh, landmine clearance teams. And what they were looking at is um, when you are a landmine clearance person, some, it's, it's risky and you may step on a landmine. And uh, if, there's, if you step on a landmine, your uh, footwear becomes part of the equation. And what they were looking into, it, it's kind of counterintuitive. You actually would want like a flip-flop would be a better thing to be wearing because the the footwear would become sh like shrapnel and go up, and the higher up it would go in the leg, the the worse, you know, the higher the, you know, the, the more infection and the higher up the amputation. So they were doing this test because people would be like, why do you need it to use a cadaver? Duh! Like the the better, the stronger the boot, the better, right? Well, in fact, no. Uh, but the way they did this, it was an army study, and they had um, rigged up again with tackle from the ceiling. It was like this ghastly marionette. It was this this um, cadaver uh, who would be rigged to actually step in a uniform like on a landmine, wearing different uh, types of footwear. And I spoke to the guy who did that work, and I said, well, what, um, you know, do, what do you tell people? He said, I tell people, like, when I'm dead, yeah, take me out back and blow me up. Because it's not, it really isn't that different than being in an anatomy lab where you're going to be taken apart bit by bit over the course of a semester or a year. He said, it's just a matter of the time frame. <laughs> it's like, it's just like that instead of, one little piece at a time. People, for people who want to get, donate their bodies to science, it's kind of a, uh, it's part of respecting their wishes to use them how, in a useful way and use whatever parts of them. And the other thing is that dead people don't actually feel any pain. This is their superpower. Um, <laughs> and, and they, you can, um, you can take a head and drop it down an elevator shaft. You can do it. And, and it sounds really awful and grisly and disrespectful, but really useful science comes out of it. it um, the cadavers tend to get used in situations where you couldn't use a live person. So you bring in those guys who don't feel anything. Um, that's ballistic gelatin. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go through my favorite recipes with you. Um, we're moving on to packing for Mars. Uh, this is a, this is a tech, technical paper from NASA called Development, this is from Uni oh, it's US, US Army Natick Laboratories, Development of Dehydrated and Bite-Sized Food Items. Um, I like to talk about the early days of, uh, the, like the Gemini era, Gemini and Apollo era of um, space travel. When you are going to be up for more than a few hours, you will need more than, you will need a snack at least. You're going to need to eat something. Um, but it's very cramped quarters. And you don't have a lot of, you know, there's weight restrictions, there's space limitations, so that you want really, really tiny compact food. Um, the other thing about the food is that you don't want any crumbs floating around because crumbs will, uh, they won't fall to the ground where you can sweep them away or under the carpet or anything. You, you really, uh, the, the crumb could get in your eye, it could go into the instrument panel. So the, the food was all bite-sized. So they were like beef sandwich and they were like little, they were these adorable, the most adorable foods ever made and the most loathed because, um, first of all, the, the coating, that horrible sort of, would tended to be made of parts of um, lard, our friend Knox gelatin, caro syrup, uh, and the coating would stick to the roof of your mouth. 
And um, they were quite reasonable. They tended to fly up into space and then fly right back down. And the other reason they were so unpleasant is that these were foods that were uh, meant to be low residue, which means you eat them and you completely absorb every, you don't, there's no fiber. There's no, there's no need to uh, get rid of any of, of the detritus of this food. You don't, and this is a good thing when you're traveling in a little tiny um, capsule without a bathroom. Um, the early spacecraft, the capsules had no toilet, no bathroom, you had a bag. You had uh, what's called a, f a fecal bag. And it was, um, it kind of was, was a plastic bag with an adhesive seal that never really was conformed really to anyone's buttocks very well. And uh, then there was also um, a finger caught, which would to be, because in zero gravity, there's no, s there's no separation. It's like nothing's falling away into the toilet. It's just hovering. It's literally just hovering. So the finger caught was to kind of coax it down along further into the bag. And um, this was just in a tremendously unpopular item. Um, <laughs> there was a transcription of, of uh, one of the meetings, one of the feedback meetings of the Apollo a astronauts after one of the Apollo missions. And the thing everybody complained about was the, the fecal bag situation. And at one point, one of the NASA brass says, we've got to do better, <laughs> which I love that. <laughs> we've got to do better. Um, but the, so the food, the food was, uh, um, in one of the papers that I found, somebody, they were, when they were, this was before, um, before Gemini, before really, before the, anybody had really thought through how are we gonna do this, somebody recommended that the solution to the problem of you know, not having a bathroom in a space capsule, the solution would be a constipated astronaut. And that was really actually part of a technical paper. Uh, and that was what was done. They, I mean, there were other reasons why the food was small and compact and was, you know, it, it was the way it was, but one of the main reasons was so that these guys wouldn't have to use the dreaded bag. Okay, if you're testing a zero-gravity toilet, well, zero-gravity toilet, briefly, it does, the water doesn't work in zero-gravity. You have uh, a whole different system. You've got air drag pulling the material, uh, pulling it away, uh, and getting rid of it, and then it sort of freeze-dries. You're just sort of sitting on a shop vac, basically. <laughs> and in order to test something like that, you need to test it in zero gravity. You have to make sure it's going to work in zero gravity. And that means you take it on one of those zero gravity simulator flights, which go like this, right? And um, so you, from here to here is where you have the zero gravity. And that's about 22 seconds <laughs> um, of weightlessness, in which some poor schmo from the waste systems department has to perform. And that's not, that's not an easy task. And in fact, I talked to this guy, Charles Borland. He's a food designer for NASA. Uh, he's retired now. And he was testing out a bunch of his different foods. So he's on there. He's on, and he said the toilet people, they were behind a curtain. But you could see when we'd start to go over and down, you could see you know, things start to rise off the floor of the plane. And you'd hear him go, 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 go. <laughs> uh, and the poor guy on that particular flight, he failed. I mean, who wouldn't fail? This brings me to. Um, SAE Technical Paper Series 20060121AO simulated human feces for testing human waste processing technologies in space systems. Um, and this is uh, this was written by um, three people: John Fisher, John Hogan, Eric Lift. Up four people, um, none of whom would return my emails at Ames Research Center. We have undertaken the task of developing human fecal simulants. Efforts under NASA funding have used. <coughs> In the past, monkey or dog feces or chicken litter. Why, like, why, this doesn't make no sense. Um, um, and they've also tried to use some of the uh, items that Kimberly Clark uses. To, there's actually a whole bunch of different simulated um, items used by the diaper industry, including um, brownie mix, pumpkin pie filling, um, miso, and refried beans. Um, <laughs> these guys, these scientists, um, and there are actually, I won't, you can come up afterwards and look at this. 5-7 is morphological appearances of formulated synthetic feces. <laughs> so the one that worked best was the, was the refried bean mix. Uh, so um, if you, should you ever need, it's just a fact that you might want to. <laughs> Astronauts, when they're out on a spacewalk, they use 
certain, you know, the big puffy white suit. It's called an EVA suit, extravehicular activity, meaning you are outside the capsule. You need a little human body-shaped room to be in to survive. And uh, you, of course, uh, have to, in case of an emergency, they have a diaper. And I, I just was curious. I was like, well, is it a special NASA? Did NASA invent that diaper? Is it, you know, because they call, they do have some they invented. It's called the Maximum Absorbent Garment, the MAG. But um, in fact, they realized just a pull-up diaper works fine. And I said, well, what brand did you guys use? And the brand that the woman at Public Affairs told me, um, and I don't know if they still use it, but at the time, uh, it was a brand of adult diaper called Rejoice. <laughs> <laughs> It just seemed like a really optimistic, <laughs> positive name for an adult diaper. And moving on to Bonk, there was a rumor circulating around here that I would be preparing one of the uh, three semen simulants. Um, and I, that was my intent. I was going to use the one, my favorite is the one, you know how on a recipe it, it will include a line like yield a dozen cupcakes or whatever? This. <laughs> This one said, yield one ejaculate. So, um, so this one, I chose this one also because it didn't require, require 15 minutes of boiling and simmering. This one was very simple. It was just cornstarch and water you know, whisked together. And I did this a couple nights ago before I came here because I was going to do this here as a sort of, I don't know, de cooking demonstration. <laughs> Uh, so, um, but it, uh, this, I whipped it up, and I, d I swear I followed, I, though it was in uh, milliliters and grams, which is difficult for me, um, a little math challenge, I think I had the proportions worked out, and it was, it was a very um, watery, milky, this was the semen of a very ill man. <laughs> this, was, this was not going to work for what I had planned, because what I had planned, in fact, was I wanted to do a reenactment. Um, Albert, Alfred Kinsey did this study uh, in the... 60s, early 60s, uh, where he was interested in the average distance traveled by ejaculate. And there was a reason for this. It, just, it wasn't just his entertainment, um, <laughs> though frequently with, some, with Kinsey's work, you do wonder. Uh, but this one was, there was a, um, for a long time, people believed that, people being researchers, fertility experts believed that the force with which the semen is thrown against the cervix determines whether or not conception, it, it plays a role in conception. So there was a thought, and this is horrible, there was a thought that you know, when a couple couldn't conceive that the guy had wambly ejaculate. Kinsey, Kinsey was like, Kinsey's seen enough ejaculations. He's like, no, this is not, this is bullshit. Kinsey, in his way, went down to Greenwich Village, recruited a bunch of men, paid them, I forget how much money, eight bucks or something, this was a while ago, and set up a high-speed camera <laughs> in someone's apartment, and the detail that I love is not one, but two sheets were laid down to protect the oriental carpets. <laughs> um, so Kinsey did this experiment. And in fact, uh, th th there was someone who had claimed that eight feet was, uh, he had no problem achieving eight feet. And that Kinsey, so Kinsey was of the opinion that it just merely glopped out for the most part. Um, that it wasn't a whole lot of spurting going on. So, uh, and in fact, the average the average distance was quite was quite short. And since the book came out, though, I get a lot of indignant mail from. <laughs> I, I have some videotape I'd like to show you. That. I'm like, <laughs> thank you very much I, for your interest in scientific inquiry. <laughs> and I believe you, I do, uh, but that's okay. And I don't click on the link. There's frequently a link, and I, I was like, <laughs> click or no, click no, no. <laughs> Um, so um, that was the um, yeah. So I so I what I wanted to do is get I don't know a syringe that kind of had the same orifice as <laughs> there was your urethral opening and kind of and, and do a little experiment here on stage for all of you and then like uh, good sense got the better of me and plus the simulant really wasn't there was something very wrong with that simulant. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the paper that the paper that that was that was the simulant was used for is fascinating. The human penis as a semen displacement device. <laughs> and these one, two, three, four, five, six students, they claim they say that the last portion of semen is an anti-semen. It's an it's a sperm killer, uh, and it, the idea is that in 
double matings, they called it. Um, they, if somebody, it, this is dating way back to you know our, our early prehistory, you know, Cro-Magnon era, um, where uh, women were very slutty. The next guy would come along, and the first thing he had to do was deal with the other guy's semen because there's this semen killing agent at the end of the ejaculates, according to these guys. So the ridge of the penis was a scoop. And that thrusting and the scoop together would remove the other guy's deadly semen. So in order to test this uh, theory that these people had, um, they went out to um, California Exotic Novelties. And they purchased uh, a series of phalluses and uh, an artificial vagina. And they actually published their data. And in fact, the ridged phallus removed twice as much semen as the non-ridged phallus. So, this was, their, this was what they were, um, they were trying to study with their su semen simulant. Anyway, so I'm sorry I'm not going to be doing the live action semen simulant ejaculation on stage for you, um, but that means you can all go home and try it. <laughs> and let's see. Now, all right, um, this is from my, uh, the book that I've just turned in. It's called Gulp. Adventures on the Alimentary Canal. It'll be out early next year. And um, I was writing, it's a long backstory that we'll skip. Let's just say I was writing about holy water enemas. <laughs> um, this, this has to do with a, a case of possession in the 1600s. It was a mother superior in a French convent. And um, the guy, the exorcist in charge of this particular case uh, felt that it wasn't enough to just sprinkle the holy water. He wanted to get that stuff right on up inside, right inside her. So he called, uh, you know, and this was out of his area of expertise. He's not an MD, he's an exorcist. So he calls, uh, at the time, enemas were given by pharmacists. And this pharmacist w was referred to, and this is an eyewitness account from the 1600s, Mr. Adam, which is, I, I don't know, they were like 1970s hairdressers, but <laughs> the pharmacists in the 1600s. So Mr. Adam was called in, and, and um, the, the, the mother superior was given these um, holy water enemas. And I, this led me to think, why not just give her a glass to drink of holy water? And that led to the subsequent curiosity, is it okay to drink holy water? Are you allowed to drink holy water? And I know, a, I know an ex-priest. And he has a lot of friends in the priesthood, and they couldn't really find an exact answer for the question of whether or not you can, uh, whether it's okay, whether the Vatican thinks it's okay to, you know, just pour a glass of holy water and have it with your communion wafer. And so I requested through interlibrary loan this very specific how-to manual for the priesthood called Celebration of Mass by Reverend J.B. O'Connell. And uh, Celebration of the Mass, has a recipe for holy water. And it's interesting because it's essentially water and a lot of salt. And my guess is that the salt, there, there was a lot of discussion back and forth about why the salt is in the holy water. And it is optional today. But the salt, I think the salt was in there because uh, you, it makes it non-potable. You, if you drink, if you drink w heavily salted water, first of all, it tastes disgusting. If you drink enough, you will throw up. This then led me to the further um, quest, question, um, what would happen if you, if you had been at communion and you'd eaten the holy communion wafer and then you tried to wash it down with the salty holy water and you threw up? And believe it or not, Celebration of the Mass by Reverend J.B. O'Connell has the answer to that question. <laughs> okay, should the celebrant, the priest, vomit the host within, say, an hour after consuming it, if the species, meaning the, the, the host, are perceptible, they are to be separated as far as possible from other matter and again swallowed. And then they'll often add a fudge factor. Like there's one section where if you drop the host into the wine, um, they basically they're telling you to start over, but that's a real pain in the ass. So they, they add this fudge factor, you know, like um, the, another host should be consecrated at least mentally. So you can just kind of think it through. What you okay? okay that's, that's good enough, and then proceed. Okay, ectoplasm spook. I wrote this book, Spook, which is about people in laboratory settings with academic degrees trying to prove or disprove that the soul exists or that there's an afterlife. People using you know technology and all kinds of things and trying to, which I love because it's just trying to 
use scientific method to pin down something that's really in the realm of spiritualism and religion. So the things that those f folks did were, were really interesting. Um, there was a period of time in the 1910s and 20s where spiritualism was big, and uh, part of spiritualism was these demonstrations where they're trying to prove to you that s the spirit world is real, it's tangible, so these mediums would kind of produce this disgusting stuff and say, see, this is the man, this is spirit energy. You can see it, but the lights would be out. Uh, and often, um, and, and people were trying to debunk them. P Harry Price was this mag magician back then, Houdini, Harry Price, both of them were trying to say, look, I know what these people are doing. And they kept coming up with more and more ways. Ectoplasm, at one point there was, this, I mean, the Sorbonne investigated the ectoplasm. Scientific American ran this three-part series on ectoplasm. Basically, it was cheesecloth. It's cheesecloth. Um, this is a wad. This is a pretty big piece of cheesecloth. Wadded up. You could coat that in like latex, a, you know, little, a condom even. And that's about, you can swallow that. That's a, not a pleasant thing to swallow, but you could. People, the mediums were expert regurgitators. Regurgitation was a sideshow act that would go on back then. And, and people, some people were naturally very gifted at you know, swallowing something and bringing it back up. Goldfish, forks, whatever, they would just like, bring it up. So um, these mediums, some of them, they, you know, they would be searched, they'd do a cavity search, they put them in a seance garment which is taped at the wrists and everywhere so they can't pull anything out of anywhere because a lot of them were, you know, it was vaginally extruded. They, these music magicians were trying to block every possible way, uh, but they didn't realize some people were, were really good regurgitators. Um, the medium would secretly kind of bring this up, open it up inside the medium. They'd sort of pull a curtain on the medium cabinet, and then the, it's dim, and then such, the, the curtains would open. There's this gross like, thing hanging down on her face. And, but some of, you know, some of the people who were investigating, and this, this is my favorite line in the whole book. <laughs> it's not my line. There's a, uh, a guy who was investigating, a French guy, Fournier d'Albe, and he was watching one of these uh, mediums who produce ectoplasm, and, and, and he requests to speak to the spirit world. He says, this material, it appears as though woven. Have you a loom in your world? <laughs> uh, and my second favorite line in all of my books, which I'll leave you with, is not, again, not my line. Uh, it's a Kinsey line, and that is, Cheese crumbs spread before a pair of copulating rats will distract the female, but not the male. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.